for the MBTA, Vibration Flow Introduction. I'm accompanied by my team members, Josie Zulu, Thomas Black, Chris Miller, and Isaac Sand. And Chris will take over the project overview and explain what the HPC was and what it controls on. Okay, so just a brief introduction to our project. Uh, like Omar said before, we work with the MBTA, more specifically their Green Line sector, um, located in New Massachusetts, and we work on the HBCU. Um, so the Green Line alone averages roughly around 200,000 plus uh, riders per weekday, so obviously it's crucial that it's constantly running and, and working conditions. And below there's the two locations for the HBCU. And then, so what is the HBCU? The HBCU is in charge of the brakes in the train. It stands for the hydraulic pressure control unit. It's basically when the conductor presses the brakes and sends the hydraulic pressure to be applied to the brake pads to stop the train. So obviously, it's crucial. It's in working condition. Um, so for per, uh, each section of the train, you have uh, three located on the train. So you have um, two on either end that are below the primary suspension unit, and then you have one in the center that is above. So the two on either end actually experience um, a great amount of force, which we'll see later. And then, so what are the problems at hand? Uh, so like I said before, there are the two that are located under the main suspension components. So they see roughly around anywhere of the 30 degrees of force. Uh, so the problem at hand is those bolts that see up 30 degrees of force will actually shear. And then the welds that hold the um, cover together will break off and there's uh, many electrical components and stuff inside so if those fail it's actually uh, very bad because the train will be in uh, not working condition and the like, emergency failure the brakes will be locked and obviously that's not what you want for your train so now uh, Joe's just going to take away with major tasks to complete so um, for major tasks to complete our uh, client current task is to focus on the component and the failure um, you might, you might think it would be ideal to like um, sort out the problem with the vibrations, but the train is bound to experience vibration as it moves along the tracks. So what we decided to do is isolate the HPCU and do some analyses on that, because that's what ex what's expected of us from our client. And then we also had to create a model uh, using SolidWorks, which one of our team members did a phenomenal job. And then after that, we had to create the prototype and then test it. Also, we had to analyze the forces on the unit just so we can see how it's reacting from the various stresses and forces that Chris has mentioned already. Um, so just to go over some of the design and engineering constraints, um, the HPCU cannot be relocated. This is something that was communicated to us from inception. We had to stick to this strictly. Um, this is because the, the current position of the HPCU is strategically placed on the train, and the MBTA in future, in a couple of years, will be changing from the Type 8 vehicles to Type 10 vehicles. So it wouldn't be ideal for them if we consider costs to change the entire uh, position, position of the unit. And then also there's limited space around the HPCU. So as you can see in Figure 6 um, on the left there, there's, not, there's a lot of mechanical components on the left of the HPCU. And from the top view in Figure 7, you can see um, the HPCU is right, right, right inside that yellow circle. The silver, the silver plate you see there, that's the HPC. So you can see that there's not much space to work with. So that's certainly a constraint that we have to consider. And then also, um, the top casing that we're looking at sits on top of a manifold that has a lot of hydraulic channels which are responsible for the braking. Um, because of that, we had to be very careful <coughs> to drill our, our holes in case we're trying to make holes into the manifold, which we did when we altered the design of the the top case and also we had to comply with FST standards. Um, these we kind of like consider them especially when we're trying to use composites. It's ideal to consider fire smoke and toxicity and abide by those um, codes. And just to show you an image of the inside of the HPCU there's a lot of electrical components as you can see there's some solenoids and transducers in there. So that kind of inhibits our ability to work with the space around the manifold. Um, this is just the design process. We started off by you know brainstorming, thinking about so many different ideas, some were funny from inception, but we kind of got serious along the way and we settled on something. Um, we did some hand calculations, some abacus simulations just to do some final element analysis, 
and we did a solid work of design, as I've mentioned, and then we did the manufacturing and the testing there after. Now, just to go over some of the theoretical calculations, um, you might think, you know, just to analyze the forces acting on the units, it's as easy as forces you put at MA or stresses you put at force over area. But we actually did a lot of calculations just to verify our new design. So our new design consists of more tabs than the old design, and it also consists of a different kind of tab. So the old design kind of used uh, vertical, ta vertical tabs, but our new design uses horizontal tabs. So because of that, we ran a lot of stress calculations, bearing stresses, bending stresses on the old design, and we got up on this stress, and actually got a safety factor around two for both sheer safety and normal safety. But with our new design, when we did our calculations, we kind of saw that our safety factor was better, it exponentially increased, and that was all due to the decreased on this stress that we obtained after doing our stress calculations. So just to go over, um, further analysis and just to show that um, our, new, our new design is better than the old one, Home is going to go over the applicant simulations, which are verified the theoretical calculations. Okay, so like Josie said, we ended up going with advocates for an FBA program to verify what we were going to do with uh, work and to solidify our, our hand calculations. So as mentioned before, we actually changed the orientation of the tab so that the bolts would be under a tensile loading instead of a shear loading, therefore um, effectively increasing the overall uh, strength of the bolt, I guess you could say. So right there we have the meshing that we use in the abacus. On the left we used a tetrahedral mesh just due to the shape, and then on the right side we have the boundary conditions for the shear bolt. We had the uh, bottom of the bolt and then the head of the bolt fixed. So then some of our simulation results, this is for the old casing. Um, so Prior to our idea, we just wanted to basically ensure that the old bolts were breaking and that Abacus would basically approve of that. So we have our conditions and you can see that we loaded the bolt on the right side with a smaller area, basically to mimic how the tab would put that, that 30 G's force on top of the bolt, um, ultimately causing it to shear. So we found out that we got a significantly higher uh, shear stress than the maximum shear strength that the bolt had. So we basically proved that the bolt would and uh, Omar is going to continue with the new case in And these are the uh, simulation results for the new orientation of the bolts. So for this one, instead of fixing the head and the end of the bolt and applying a, uh, applying a load on the three millimeter thickness area, which was the thickness of the tab, we fixed the end of the bolt and applied a pressure load on the bottom head of the bolt so we can utilize the tensile, the tensile strength of the bolt instead of its shear. The maximum tensile, the maximum tensile strength of SA three or four steel is almost 700 megapascals, while the shear is around 400. So we have a, like a bigger leeway to work with, since 700 is almost double 400. For the uh, to verify our abacus simulations and to make it to uh, fortify our boundary conditions, and double check if we're on the right track or not, we simply want the vertical tabs with the boundary conditions that we assigned to it, just to, see, just to see if it would fail similar to what it feel like in real life. And we can see that both tabs failed in the exact same orientation, both facing outward. After they were fixed, we fixed the vertical tab on the outline since it would be welded onto the box. So we fixed it and we applied the load on the, uh, the hole that we drilled into it on, with the force of 30 Gs applied. And uh, now Tom will take over the uh, the, uh, sorry, Isaac will take over the SOLIDWORKS design and how we manufacture the box. So for our new design, we wanted to address the main failure points in the MBTA's current HPCU casing design. This means that um, addressing the cracking of the welds at the 90 degree corners, as well as the shearing of the bolts when the tabs are vertical. Our new design has a bend at that 90 degree corner, and we incorporated five horizontal tabs because the hand calculations and simulations show that those tabs would be ideal for the situation. There's also one tab that is welded on and vertical, and that is mainly for alignment purposes. I also want to point out that our new tabs aren't welded on, they're actually bent off the body of the casing. Our new design is also made of SAE 304 stainless steel and is 1 8 inch, de inch thick. This design is thicker than the original casing design, but we wanted to keep that thickness because of um, cracking that occurred on taps in the past. 
So here you can see how two pieces of sheet metal could be laser cut and then bent to create our design. Um, you can see that the top is labeled A and the bottom is labeled B. And then this is a top view of the casing where it has been bent and the weld points are in the yellow circles highlighted as above. We sent these two drawings, as, met, as well as many others, to Denmark Corporation, and they were very easy to work with, and they got our product made in a very timely manner. And just some more comparison on our design versus their design. Um, we had to keep the shape of it fairly similar. We wanted to experiment with it, but because of the high density of electronic components that go inside, as well as many electronic components that get drilled into the side of the casing, it was easier to it was best for us to keep a lot of holes in the same positions so that transitioning from their casing to our new design would be easy. And this is just another example of the inside and how we maximize the interior tab locations for our new design. And Tom's going to talk about some testing. Uh, so in order to prove that our new design was better than the old one, we had to we conducted a vibration test. Um, to put it on the train and to let it go, um, that testing that way would take too long. So we decided to reach out to uh, vibration testing facilities to conduct an accelerated test. Um, so we wanted to test the two casings side by side to compare um, failure points. Uh, so failure criteria would be bolt shearing, uh, a tab breaking, or a weld crack. Our preliminary testing was done by a company called Quest Engineering Solutions in Billerick, Mass. Um, they used an electrodynamic vibrator, or also known as a shaker, to conduct the testing. Each casing um, went, up, went under a 15 G and a 30 G load for about an hour each. Um, so we believe that because of a pre-existing stress on a vertical bolt in our new design, the bolt sheared uh, cheer prematurely. So it was we determined that the test was inconclusive. Uh, that being said, with minor adjustments, we believe that a test will show that our, our design is a viable solution. Uh, so further improvements, um, along with ensuring that the bolts are aligned correctly, um, possibility is to lower the thickness when manufacturing to um, reduce the weight, and also using bigger bolts to compensate for the weight if we're staying the size of the bolts. Currently, the MBTA spends about $117 when buying bulk, about 150 units. Um, when a unit breaks, it costs them $860 to fix, and they estimate around 50 to 20 units break per month, resulting in a cost of from $12,900 to $17,200. So our new unit, we got priced at $290 per unit when buying bulk. Um, so with the few adjustments that we need to be make, made, um, we <coughs> decrease their value rate by at least 50% um, to make to have them have an average yearly savings of $8,000. So based on our uh, hand calculations and simulations, we we are fairly certain that our project, that our prototype and design, if the MBTA chooses to go forward with it, we'd be saving them tens, if not hundreds of thousands on the annual basis on repairs and man hours. And this project in general was a fun and a wholesome project. We got to experience the engineering world firsthand. We got to tour facilities, factories, and laboratories. It was, it was nice. And in the end, we'd like to thank the, uh, the entire m and &E department, starting from Sue, to Professor Purdue, to Professor Afsun, who's been with us from the beginning and helped us through the entire journey, ups and downs. I'd also like to thank Mr. Brian Banschwitz and Mr. Mike Walsh for being in this project, to UMass and being there and helping us when we need them.